A robot that balances itself on only two wheels? How is that even possible? Well, you better believe it because I built it. This is a self-balancing Lego Segway robot, which keeps itself upright on two wheels using PID technology. If you want to find out how I use the brand new Lego Mindstorms to make this amazing self-balancing robot and learn about all the sciencey details that went into making it possible, you better stick around. What's going on everyone? My name is Kyle and you are watching BuilderDude35, a YouTube channel that is all about Lego Mindstorms. In today's video, I'm teaching you all about the Lego Segway that I built using the fourth generation Robot Inventor. This video is a collaboration with my colleague Gary from the land down under. Gary runs his own YouTube channel called Creator Academy Australia, which is another excellent resource for learning robotics through the Lego platform. And he was the one who originally designed this robot, which he calls Gyro Girl. That's right, we're breaking down gender stereotypes in the STEM world. He reached out to me to see if I was interested in re-implementing his Gyro Girl robot design in the new Robot Inventor Mindstorms platform. And of course, I said yes. Gary was also super kind enough to make these really clean intro branding animations that you see on my videos now. Thank you so much, Gary, for that. They look fantastic. In my opinion, one of the most brilliant aspects of this robot design is just how simple it is to build. I mean, take a look at it. You only need a handful of Lego parts. It starts with the intelligent hub up here, and then you connect two motors on either side of the bottom of the intelligent hub with wheels on the end so you're attaching the wheels directly to the glide wheel part of these motors and then you can wrap the cables around the back and that's all you need to start building your own Segway style robot. This intelligent hub already has its own built-in three axis gyroscope and that's the sensor that we're going to be using to do the self-balancing. If you haven't already, check out my video that's all about how to program the gyroscope for the robot inventor. I'll put the link up here for you guys. You may be wondering, what on earth does a gyro sensor actually do? Well, to make a longer story short, a gyro sensor is responsible for measuring angular rate of rotation. So when the robot rotates around an axis, and remember I said the gyroscope has three of these axes, they're called pitch, roll, and yaw, the gyro is able to measure how fast the robot is rotating around each of these axes. Then it applies a method called integration, which is basically where it adds up all of the rates of rotation to give you an output accumulated angle to tell you how far your robot has rotated along each of these axes. So what's the big idea behind this robot? How does it work and what makes it so special? Well, these types of robots or segways in general are a type of engineering problem called an inverted pendulum because the fulcrum, AKA the point around which the robot rotates is below the center of mass, which is up here. And this is an interesting problem because an inverted pendulum is inherently unstable. If the center of mass moves even a tiny little bit, that's enough to cause the robot to rotate and fall over because the force of gravity is now unequally pulling the robot down to one side and it's going to plop flat on its face. So how do we get the robot to balance? Well, that's where we need an active system to keep the robot upright. And that's where the gyro sensor that I mentioned before comes in handy. When the gyro's angle increases, it's going to drive the wheels in the forward direction. What this does is it moves the fulcrum back underneath the center of mass to restabilize the system. And if you can think, we're going to be doing this in an infinite loop over and over again. So for every little perturbation, that means for every tiny little change in the position of the center of mass relative to the fulcrum, we're going to drive the wheels in a way that moves the fulcrum back under the center of mass and prevents it from falling. And that is an active feedback. Loop. Feedback loops are everywhere in engineering systems. And if you followed a line following tutorial on this channel, you've probably made a feedback loop already, even if you didn't know it. But not all feedback loops are suitable for solving this inverted pendulum problem. As a matter of fact, we need a very specific type of feedback loop called PID. PID stands for proportional integral derivative, and it describes how the robot responds to errors in its system in order to keep the robot on track. As you can probably guess, a PID controller works in three stages. The first stage is the proportional stage, commonly abbreviated as the P stage. What this stage does is it makes immediate corrections based on whatever the current error of the robot is, and all of the corrections are proportional to the error. The error is basically a measurement that tells you how far away the robot 
is from its ideal state. In our case, how many degrees away the robot is from being perfectly balanced. And we can take this measured error value and multiply it by a constant value called the KP to get a correction back out. So what this ends up meaning is a small error will give us a small correction and a large error will give us a large correction. The size of the correction we make is proportional to the size of the original error, hence the name for the proportional stage. The second stage of a PID controller is called the integral stage or the I stage. Now integral is a very scary calculus word that you'll probably have to face a lot when you go to college. Basically what the integral stage does is it adds up all of the errors during the entire time the robot has been running and it's looking for long-term trends in the error. So for example if the integral is positive after a while that means the robot is consistently trending in one way. That means you're getting consistently a positive error or an error in a specific direction and that informs the robot that it needs to start being more assertive with correcting the robot in the other direction. If the integral stage is all about long-term changes in error then the derivative stage or D stage which is the third component of our PID controller is all about short-term changes in error. In our algorithm what the derivative stage will do is it will look at the error of the current step and then look at the error one time step behind it so the last time that we measured an error and compare the two of them and the magnitude of the error change as well as the sign or direction of the error change informs the robot on whether or not the change in the trajectory that it made from the last time step is working or not. So for example if you see a very large negative derivative that means that the error has decreased a bunch between last time step and now and the robot made a good change the robot has now moved itself much closer to its target position. On the other hand, if you see a positive change in the derivative, that means the robot has actually trended worse. It's now farther away from its desired position than where it was on the last time step. So the derivative is really important in the feedback loop for telling you whether the change that you just made was a good change or not. Understanding the intuition behind how this PID controller works is going to be essential for getting it working because after you write all the code, you have to then go and tune this controller, which means adjusting the relative influence of the P, I, and D stages until you get a feedback loop that is nice and smooth and keeps the robot balanced upright. I want to take just a few minutes to walk you all through the code. As you can see, I have it pulled up now and it's written in Scratch, which is one of the native languages for the Robot Inventor. The very first line, very simple, just paints a smiley face on the LED matrix on the front of the Robot Inventor's Intelligent Hub. You know just for fun. And then we have a block that actually waits for three seconds. The reason why we have this is because it gives you enough time to pick up the robot and hold it in the position that you want it to be before the robot starts balancing. Just to give you enough time to get it set up in an upright position and then the PID controller takes it from there to get the robot to balance. And after that we have a whole bunch of variables. The first variable that we have defined is called roll target and this is the target angle that we want the robot to maintain ideally when it is perfectly balanced. It's not going to be 100% perfect, but this is the upright position where the robot is most likely to not fall forward or backward. And for my robot, this happened to be 88.95, and that's just the way the mass was balanced above the two wheels here. Feel free to play around with that. Next, we have the power variable, which controls how fast the motors react when they need to make a correction. After that, we have the three K values, KP, KI and KD, which as you can probably guess, correspond to each of the P, I, and D phases of the PID controller that I just explained before. We refer to these as K values, which are just fancy names for constants that control how powerful each stage of the PID controller is. So for example, a large KP value will mean that the proportional stage of the PID controller is going to have more influence. So when people talk about tuning a PID controller, this is what they're talking about adjusting these three K values to get a balance of P, I, and D that keeps your robot upright or whatever you're using a PID system for. And later on in the video, I'm going to give you some advice for tuning these values and also refer back to the earlier segment where I explained the PID algorithm to kind of get an intuition for how they work. After that, we have a bunch of variables which we initialize to zero. Their values aren't important right now, but we define them as placeholders so we can use them later in the code to store important information while the PID algorithm 
algorithm is running. The first one of these is error, which as you could probably guess holds the error value, which is where we compare the current angle on the gyroscope to the target or to the roll target that we just defined. The variable after that is integral, which as you could probably guess is interesting in the I phase of the PID controller. And last but not least, we have derivative and last error, which are interesting for the D phase of the PID controller. I'll explain what these do in just a moment because we're right about to get to them. And then we set the movement motors to E and A. Nothing too special there, that's just how I happen to plug in the motors on my robot. Could be different for your robot. And now we go into this forever loop, and this is where the really interesting part happens. This is where the meat and potatoes of the PID algorithm lives. And it's inside this loop where the robot is constantly reading the value on its gyro sensor, comparing it to its target value, doing a bunch of math on it to get a correction, and hopefully correcting its trajectory enough to keep it standing upright. So let's go through what happens in this part. The very first part is us setting a value for that error variable that I mentioned before. An error is defined as the difference between your roll target and the current reading on the roll axis of the gyroscope. So again, it's your target minus the current gyro measurement. It's important to use the roll axis, which is this long axis of the Intelligent Hub here for balancing. And if you set your robot up like this, you're golden and good to go. It happens that on one of the axes, there's a weird dead zone in the gyro sensor. I talked about it in my gyro sensor video early on, so check that out if you want more info. This is something that Gary actually let me know is an interesting quirk of the gyro, but that means you can't use one specific axis for balancing, but it happens that the roll, the roll axis is totally good to go. The next phase is calculating the integral, and as I mentioned before, the integral is found by summing up all of the errors over time. So really this expression is integral equals whatever the current value of the integral is plus the error, and we actually also multiply the error by a magic number of 0.25. Ideally this should also be another tunable parameter, it's kind of like bad coding practice that I just inserted a magic number there, but 0.25 5 is there kind of as a scaling factor before it goes into the integral so just some food for thought. Make sure that you don't put that scaling factor on the outside of the expression. So what I mean is don't keep multiplying the integral sum by that, otherwise you'll have an exponentially decaying integral value over time and that's not fun because then your robot won't make any integral corrections over time. So just be conscious that you're setting up that multiplication inside of that addition. After that, we're going to calculate the derivative, which is very simply the difference between the current error and the last error. Like I said before, it's it's basically comparing uh, what the error was in the last time step to the current time step to see if the correction that we made last time was a good one or not. And that will inform us on whether we need to keep making a similar correction. Associated with that, after we read out that last error value, we set whatever the current error is to the value of last error. So next time the loop comes around, we can call it back up in the last error variable. Now we have a line that's pretty spicy where we put all of the P, I, and D factors together to get a final output of the PID algorithm. And this is known as a linear combination because we're taking each of the contributions of the P, I, and D controllers, multiplying them by KP, KI, and KD respectively, and then adding each of those multiplied contributions together to get a final output for our algorithm. So I know that's a lot of fancy math mumbo jumbo, but basically what that means is we have KP times error, KI times integral, and KD times derivative, and then we're taking those three quantities and adding them together, and that's the output of our PID algorithm. And that we store in a variable, and we read that back again in the very next line, and we take the PID algorithm output and multiply it by our power variable, and then we plug that in as the driving power for our motors down here. And that is how we get the final correction that we communicate to the motors uh, to get the robot to adjust its trajectory to bring the wheels back underneath the center of mass. And of course there's also, just because of a quirk of the way the scratch programming works on Robot Inventor, after you set the movement speed, uh, you have to also say start moving in a straight line to actually get the motors to move. So those last two pink blocks work together. And that, my friends, is the PID algorithm for this robot all explained. Any seasoned BuilderDude35 veteran knows that after you've written the code for one of these PID controllers, you're really only done with half of the battle. That's because now you have to tune this bad boy. So you need to look at adjusting each of the KP, KI, and KD parameters to adjust the relative influence of each of 
the stages and get a smooth robot that balances itself correctly. The tuning stage requires quite a bit of patience. It can take a while, but there are a few tips and rules of thumb that you can follow to make the experience a little bit better. Don't hesitate to refer back to the intuition that I gave you earlier in the video to tell you about what's going on inside of this algorithm to help you debug it. But there's also a handful of things that you can look out for that will help you tune. For example, if you see that a small perturbation in the robot's position, which means a small offset from being balanced, causes the robot to immediately overreact in the opposite direction way too strongly, that's how you know you're going to have to look at your P stage because the robot is making a proportional correction that is too large. If you notice that the robot is usually trending in one direction, so for example, the robot seems to balance itself well, but if the robot has a large swing in one direction, it's not really able to recover, that's when you know you're gonna be looking at the I value, the integral stage. And if you see that the robot makes a good correction, but then continues to overcorrect after that, then you're going to be looking at the D or the derivative stage. And last but not least, if you see the robot correcting itself in the wrong direction, such that it never balances itself, that's when you know you need to throw a negative sign in front of all of your K values, and that'll flip the direction of the corrections that your robot makes to get you back on track. Also, don't be afraid to play with that target value that I mentioned before, because ideally this is the degree value where the robot should be most balanced. So if you find that the active algorithm is trying to balance balance the robot on a part that is actually not physically balanced for the robot, you might want to play around with the degree value you set as the target to find an equilibrium position that it more closely reflects the natural weight balance of the robot. Also, the surface on which you test your robot matters quite a bit. You saw in the demos that I'm using this kind of medium soft carpet, and that's what I've found to be easiest to use. The carpet adds a little bit of friction that dampens the robot's motions and gives the robot a little bit more time to make adjustments and react when it falls. Hard surfaces like tile or wood flooring are a bit more difficult, but could make a unique challenge if you're up to it. And once again, I want to give a big shout out to Gary from Creator Academy Australia for contributing the robot design for this video, as well as the super clean intro animation he gave me. Be sure to check out his video on the original Gyro Girl with Spike Prime if you haven't already. Thank you so much for watching guys. Let me know in the comments below what was your favorite or most surprising thing that you learned from this video. I personally think PID controllers are really awesome and I hope you had a lot of fun learning about them too. Anyway, I hope to see you in next week's video. Thanks so much guys and I'll see you soon.